the Buddha once said that all he taught was suffering and the end of suffering, or to translate it another way, stress and the end of stress. That statement right there says several things. One, it focuses you on the issue that you should be paying attention to. And secondly, it tells you how you should pay attention to it. The first point is important because we tend to create all kinds of other issues in our lives. And the big issue of why we're making, making ourselves suffer gets pushed aside, gets covered up. Because we have so many other priorities, we want to have some other problem solved first, or some other issue explained or explained away. And so the Buddha is saying, you really got to focus on this as the primary issue. Pay careful attention. What is the suffering? And what would be the end of suffering? That's how you focus on the topic. In other words, you're looking at it in such a way that you can put an end to it. The Buddha, of course, is not forcing you to look at it this way. He's not even forcing you to look at suffering. The suffering itself pushes you. But he's recommending that this is a crucial thing to focus on, and you want to focus on it in such a way so you see what's causing it, what you can do to put an end to it, and if it really is possible to put an end to it. That gives you the Four Noble Truths. And each of those truths has a duty. You try to comprehend suffering. In other words, sit with it long enough to watch it and figure out what really is the suffering here. You know, he boils it down to the five clinging aggregates, which is not an immediate, really clear or obvious way of explaining it. To see it in those terms, you have to look at it carefully and take it apart. So that when you see, see what suffering is, then you can watch it carefully enough to see what the cause is. Develop dispassion for the cause and let it go. And to do that, you have to develop the path so you can realize the end of suffering. Those are the duties. And they all go together. You can't comprehend suffering without developing the path, which is what we're doing here right now, focusing on the breath, trying to give rise to say the right concentration, and once it's there, trying to maintain it so that it develops. So we're applying appropriate attention and trying to develop appropriate intentions around this too. These two qualities have to go together. The fact that we're focusing on the problem of suffering is because we want to put an end to it. There's an intention right there and that we want to understand it properly so that we can do it effectively. So we listen to the teachings on Four Noble Truths, appropriate attention, and then we decide that we're going to try to put them into practice. Like right now, where you're trying to give rise to the state of concentration. That's the appropriate duty with regard to the path. You develop it. You don't just sit and watch, oh, here comes some mindfulness, and there it goes. Where it comes a moment of concentration, and there it goes. That's not insight, that's laziness. There's work to be done here. And so if it's not working, things aren't developing, you have to ask yourself, what's lacking? Are you not really focusing on the issue of suffering? Think about it for a while. If you could put an end to the suffering that you cause yourself. There'd be a lot of good that would come in all kinds of directions. You could live with the difficulties in the world and not suffer from them. And the world is a difficult place. And we make ourselves suffer over the difficulties, but we don't have to. That's the good news here. There is a way to understand the processes of the mind and develop this passion for all the things that make us suffer. It's funny, we are passionate for the things that make us suffer. That's our problem.
We like a lot of the things that cause suffering, and we actually like a lot of things that really are suffering in and of themselves, but we don't recognize them. So that's the first part of appropriate attention. Appropriate attention is to learn how to recognize these things and see the importance of this problem. And to see how the mind is creating lots of problems for itself if it avoids looking at this problem and working on it with the proper framework. That's why we have the contemplation of the parts of the body. A lot of times we look for pleasure in the body. But what's there of any real permanent essence there that we can really rely on? That's why we have contemplation of death. The body's going to leave us. We're going to leave this world. And where do we, we're going to take with us? Well, we're going to take our actions, but we can live the best life possible in this lifetime and still have some bad karma from a previous lifetime. Who knows what could sneak in? So we're in a very precarious position. So it's good to see the precariousness. They can develop a sense of sangwega for any type of attention or intention that doesn't fall in with the Four Noble Truths. When I mean, you can lose interest in the other things that pull you away from developing concentration, then you can really work on that intention to get the mind focused. Then it becomes an issue of learning how to understand your mind. What does your mind like to settle down with? Concentration is not meant to be forcing yourself to stay with something you don't like. You have to have a sense of pleasure for the mind to settle down here. So find an object that the mind finds congenial, that you like to stay with. You can stay with at least some period of time. Work with the breath so it becomes comfortable, so it becomes interesting. That will help nurture your intention to stay with it. This quality of generating desire, in other words, motivating yourself, is really important. But it also requires that you learn how to read your mind. You get a sense of what works and what doesn't work. This is why we spend time with a, with a meditation. It requires a certain amount of familiarity. And some imagination. What are the different ways you could breathe? What are the different parts of the body that could be doing the breathing for you? We have instinctive ways of either having the chest breathe or the stomach breathe or the shoulders breathe. Sometimes there are patterns of tension that come in and out in the head. We take them for granted. It's good to ask yourself, are these the way, the only ways we can breathe? Are there other ways we could breathe? What if we think of the whole nervous system doing the breathing? What does that do? In other words, in order to pay attention to the concentration, you have to motivate yourself so that your intention is also really focused. So the two qualities go together, appropriate attention, appropriate intention. They feed off of one another. The intention turns into concentration. The attention is what develops your discernment. So you need both. And they have to be appropriate. There is no such thing as bare attention in the Buddhist teachings. It's always colored by your intentions. So learn how to make your intentions properly focused. To figure out why it was that after all the things the Buddha learned in his awakening, this was the issue he focused on teaching. And everything in his teachings revolves around this one question. It's not like suffering was the only topic he mentioned, but everything he talks about 
he deals from this perspective. How to understand the way in which you're creating suffering for yourself, and how to understand things so you can put an end to it. When your focus really is narrowed down to this point, you find that it's not just a narrow point, it covers a huge area of your life. But if you can solve this one problem, all your other problems are not going to weigh on the mind. Some things you can solve, some things you can't. That's the way of the world. But this is a problem you can solve, and it's really worthwhile. And the solution shows you things that you might never expect it. <laughs>